asking, does Jesus, who knows all, care about my situation? Does he know and does he care? And today we're talking about depression and loneliness. So read with me. We're in 1 Kings chapter 19, starting at verse 9, about an episode in the prophet Elijah's life. And the word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altar, and put your prophets to death with the sword. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came. Go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazazel, king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Meholah, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazael. And Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet... I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and all whose mouths have not kissed him. Bow with me in prayer. Our most precious Heavenly Father, we love you so much, and we thank you for this scripture that speaks to us. Open our minds and hearts to what you would have for us to hear to help us to know how much you care, how much you love us, so that we may praise and worship and glorify you even more. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I want to give you some backstory to this story about Elijah. That was the end of it. You're probably familiar with the story, but I want to refresh your memory. Ahab had become king of Israel, the northern kingdom. I've got a map to show you how that was broken down. The blue is the northern kingdom of Israel. The orange below is Judah. After Solomon, there was turmoil in the land. Of course, Solomon, while he loved God and honored him, did disobey God and do some things that God wasn't pleased with. And the nation split after that into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom. And it can get confusing as we read because the northern kingdom is called Israel and the southern kingdom Judah. And so other times when we talk about Israel, we mean the whole part of the land. And during this period, we're only talking about the northern part. Ahab was king of the northern part and he was a wicked king did not honor God at all. He had prophets of Baal. And so God issued a decree that there would be no rain for many years. The story picks up three years later after severe drought. And Elijah had been sought for by Ahab. Ahab tried to find him. Ahab would have killed him or entreated him at best and killed him at worst. But he couldn't find Elijah. God had protected him. Well, God comes to Elijah and says, you need to go present yourself to Ahab. And so he does. And it's interesting 
the response, and we, we hear that response in our world today. When Ahab came to Elijah and saw him, he says, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? Elijah was blaming the problems of Israel on Elijah. Elijah was the messenger. And of course, the troubler of, of Israel, and I, Elijah made this point, said, it's not me that's troubling Israel, it is you, King Ahab, because you fail to honor God. And then he said, let's put it to a test. You call all your prophets of Baal to Mount Carmel, and I will be there, and we will see whose God is God. And Elijah also makes a challenge to the Israelites because the Israelites had turned away from the ways of God. And he challenged them to decide whom they were going to worship, that they were going to see the mighty hand of God. And so Elijah gives the prophets of Baal the first shot. They set up their altar They take a bull, they sacrifice it on the altar, and then they began their entreaties to the god Baal, little g, their god, the one they worshipped, to come and consume the sacrifice. All day, all morning, they chanted, they jumped around, they did their thing, and nothing happened. Elijah starts to taunt them, says, maybe your god is asleep, maybe you need to shout louder. So they went into even more frenzied effort And, of course, Baal doesn't respond. Of course, Baal is not real. He was a fabric of their imagination, their contrivances. So Elijah says, okay, my turn. They build the altar, stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. They put the bull on it. And then Elijah starts showing off a little bit, showing out. He says, come, drench it with water. So they bring water and they drench the altar with it. He says, do it again. So they bring another and they drench the altar. He said, do it a third time. They do it a third time. They drench. There's so much water, it's standing in the trough around the altar. Now remember, the land had been in drought, so the land would have soaked up the water readily. So that tells you just how much was there. And then Elijah issues... just prays just a simple prayer asking God to come and glorify himself. And instantly a fire from heaven came down and we're told that it consumed the bull sacrifice, it consumed the altar, and it licked up all the water in the trenches. A mighty and great victory. There were 450 prophets of Baal there and just one Elijah up against them. It had to be a tremendously emotional day, strenuous day for Elijah, standing before all of those who would readily kill him uh, were their God to have responded. As it is, Elijah is able to turn tables on the prophets of Baal and he orders all of them killed. And they do that. Then he says, get ready, O king, talking to Ahab, for a storm's coming. And he sends Obadiah, and he says, look to the west. Obadiah looks, he doesn't see anything. Look again, Obadiah, he sees a small cloud form. Then he tells King Ahab, you better get on your way to Jezreel, because a storm's coming, and your cart will be mired in the mud. So Ahab sets out, and sure enough, a fierce wind comes up, and a a great thunderstorm comes. And Ahab starts the chariot towards Jezreel, some 30 miles away. Elijah sets out on foot running to get there, and he gets there ahead of them. They get to Jezreel. Ahab tells Jezebel, his wife, what had happened, and she swears that she's going to kill Elijah. Elijah then, fearing for his life, he takes off to Judah. And he goes down to Beersheba, which is about 113 miles on foot. Takes him a while, of course. And all of this is important because we're 
setting up Elijah's physical and emotional state. When he gets to Beersheba, he, uh, he continues on his journey. He's, he's fed, an angel comes, nurses him, and he gets, continues on his journey, and he goes down to Mount Horeb. Many think that's also Mount Sinai from Moses' days to the bottom of the Sinai Peninsula and hides in a cave. And that was another 275 or 260 miles. So now he has gone on foot for about 350, almost 400 miles, mountainous terrain after a strenuous day. So you can imagine when he got to the cave, he was very tired. He was exhausted. He had given it all. And God comes to him. God, of course, knows all things. God had ordered Elijah to set up this contest, as it were, with the prophets of Baal. He'd seen Elijah on his track. He had sent an angel to feed him. Elijah's in the cave. And God asked this question, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah repeats what he had told the Israelites earlier before he started. I'm the only one standing up for the Lord. I'm the only prophet left. No one stands with me. He's having a little pity party, we might say. He's having a time of depression, thinking he's alone, thinking there's no one else living for God, striving for God. And then God does this display that we read about. God has a massive storm come up. Elijah realizes God's not in that storm. Then an earthquake comes and shakes the mountain and knocks the rocks down. And Elijah, too, realizes that God's not in the earthquake. And then God speaks. We refer to it as a still, small voice, a gentle whisper. Elijah knew it was the Word of God, the voice of God. So he goes and stands in the entrance, worshiping God, knowing God knows he's there. And God asks that question again. What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah repeats his mantra. Oh God, I'm the only one serving you. I'm the only one left. Everyone's out to kill me. And one of the things that I take from this and I, I share with you today is God's response. God doesn't get angry with him. He doesn't chastise him. He doesn't yell at him. He doesn't, he doesn't seek to destroy him. He just very calmly is asking Elijah to kind of evaluate where he is and what he's doing when he says, what are you doing here, Elijah? And to me, the subtext of that is, this is not where I want you. But it's that gentle response of God, that understanding response of God. He knows Elijah's physical condition, that he's exhausted, that he hasn't eaten much, that he's run all this way. He knows the turmoil it was, the the uh, emotions and the intensity of standing before the prophets of Baal and all the people of Israelite representing God. He understands that Elijah is exhausted. I shared with you many months ago, not long after I first came, a quote by Vince Lombardi, coach of the Green Bay Packers, one of my favorite teams of years past. Vince Lombardi made the statement, fatigue makes cowards of us all. When we're tired, we just don't have that constitution, that strength to stand strong as we can when we're rested. And that's where Elijah was. He was fatigued. He was tired. And he felt alone. He felt abandoned. And I don't know all that went in his mind. Perhaps he felt 
that it was unfair, that here he had stood up for Almighty God. He had faced down the prophets of Baal and Ahab, and here Jezebel threatens his life. Why wouldn't God protect him? Why wouldn't God keep that from happening? Maybe all these kind of things went through his mind as he's trying to digest everything going on. The Scripture doesn't tell us that. It's conjecture. We don't know. But it would make sense that he's wondering all these things. God speaks to Elijah. While God is all-powerful, while God can shake the foundations of the earth, he was speaking to Elijah and said that he's not in that power, but he's present, quietly speaking to us, teaching us, leading us, guiding us, and encouraging us. And so Elijah is in this place. As far as he was concerned, he's the only one standing up for the Lord. I made a statement recently in my uh, lesson on the five love languages that perception is reality. And perception really isn't reality, but how we perceive a matter, how we perceive what's happening is what we act upon. Our perception of something molds our reactions. And so Elijah perceived that he was the only prophet. And he thought he was facing undue persecution, undue loneliness. Loneliness is not the same as being alone. If you've lived many years and if you've had time, you know that. Sometimes when you're alone, you feel fine. You might kind of like it. It's a little calm. You can read the book you want to read, watch what you want on TV. And you can be lonely in a crowd. You may have experienced that. You may have been in a great big throng of people, and yet you felt alone. And that typically comes because, again, we think we're the only ones, and no one knows our situation no one knows the pain I'm feeling. No one knows what's going on with me. And so even though we may be surrounded by many people, we feel alone. And it's not a pleasant feeling. We humans are made as social creatures. Recently in studying, I came across again Genesis chapter 2, specifically verse 18. And God is there in the garden with Adam. He uses Adam to name the animals. The animals would have had no fear of, of Adam. He, had to, he didn't have to worry about the lion eating him. He was able to enjoy God's creation. God came and communed with him directly. But God realized Adam needed a little more. He needed human companionship. And in 2.18... We have recorded, the Lord said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And then he put Adam to sleep. He created Eve out of Adam. He gave him a companion, a helpmeet. And this is not, while this is referring specifically Adam to Eve, it's true for all of us. We all need people in our lives. We all need a friend. We all need companions. That's a normal way of the way we, we are made. And so when we're feeling alone, it's a painful thing. God knew all this. He knew Elijah needed friends. He knew Elijah was exhausted. He knew Elijah was feeling depressed and alone. But he didn't react in judgment or criticism he didn't say, you're, you're, you're not being faithful. You should know better than this. You know me. You know I'm God. That should be enough for you, Elijah. No, he just quietly urges him. He doesn't reprimand him. He just says, what are you doing here? God knew why Elijah was there, but he needed Elijah to figure it out. 
God knows where you are. He knows why you are where you are. He knows the forces that have worked in your life, the things that are going on, but also the things in your past that have molded you, that have created how you react to situations. We all have that impact of the past. You may have a, uh, I call it like a tape in your head that runs of something someone said to you many, many years ago. I, I have one that my mom, in exasperation, said to me one day. She said, Wes, all the other children seem to know when to settle down, but you don't. You just keep on pushing it. And that's obviously still in my head today. We have those little tapes, those things running, and they all affect how we live and go about our day. And God knows that. He knows what you're trying to overcome. He knows uh, the challenges you've built. He, he knows the traumas you've been through. None of us here, while some of you are very good friends who have known each other for many, many years, still we can't know very well the depths of a person, what drives, but God does. God does know you. And He doesn't chastise you. He doesn't say you, you shouldn't be that way. He doesn't say get over it. But He will say, what are you doing here? The Apostle Paul wrote of those times when we're so burdened and in such pain that we don't know what to say. And he says, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with groanings and utterances. When we're before the Lord just hurting so much, we can't even utter what it is that's on our hearts. God knows. And the Holy Spirit ministers to us and helps us through those situations. God loves you and He knows your feelings of desperation and loneliness. He doesn't chastise us. He doesn't mock us like our family can. He doesn't tell us, get over it. Pick yourself up by your bootstraps. Just get on with it because they don't want to hear it anymore. He doesn't reject us as weak and useless. He comes to us lovingly, softly, speaking to us, like Elijah, we have to learn to hear his voice. Typically, we think we would like God to speak out loud, just tell me what it is. Show me, Lord. The truth is, if God revealed himself in that way, we'd be terrified. We'd be like Isaiah when he saw the Lord high and lifted up, and he said, woe is me, for I am undone, for I have seen the face of God. God mercifully speaks to us softly, but also because He wants us to learn to listen. How much would we enjoy our children to just listen to us when we tell them something? One time my son and I were talking. We'd done that a few times. In this particular time, He's relating a, a time with one of his sons. And he said something I think I'd said to my son before. And he says, why couldn't you just do what I asked the first time? Instead, you push it and push it until I get angry and I blurt it out in a harsh way and then your feelings are hurt. If you had just listened to me the first time, I said, don't do that. I wouldn't have to get angry with you. Well, that's what God wants us to learn to do with Him. He doesn't want to have to get direct with us. He doesn't want to have to get harsh. He doesn't want to have to punish us or chastise us. He's saying, just listen, learn my voice. Listen to me. He's there speaking. But there are some things we need to understand about depression and feeling of loneliness. And first, I want to start with this to remind you that sometimes, most of the time, depression and loneliness is a short-lived feeling. It's a moment we go through because we're tired, 
because an event has happened uh, and, and over time we rest or we get over it, there are those times, but there is also clinical depression. It's a real illness. It's a misbalance in our body, just as any illness is. And if you struggle with ongoing depression, especially when there's not really anything you can point to about why you're depressed, I urge you to see a professional. It is, there are physiological bases for clinical depression, and it's important to not be ashamed, to, to not be afraid to seek out that help and to find someone who knows. Maybe it's medicine, maybe it's counseling, but it's a very real thing, and we need to understand that in each other. We need to understand that those who are struggling with depression, and it can get so bad they can't get out of their bed and function. They can't get up and feed their children. They're not just weak or lazy. It's a real debilitating Be there for them. Pray for them. But if your depression is not physiological, it is probably episodic, meaning something's happened or is happening in your life, making you depressed due to grief, loss, tragedy, some other real-life situations. These episodes may be short-lived. Sometimes they go on for years. Sometimes it takes us a long time to deal with grief, and maybe we never do. Maybe we never really face it. But they're not clinical in nature. They're not physiological. And we can come out of that if we will, if we'll do our trusting in God, if we will look to Him. Like Elijah, your, those feelings of depression may come from a bad time, fatigue. And this is where a group of good friends can help, and especially a very close friend who cares enough to not let you make decisions while you're depressed. It's important for us to realize that I am tired and I'm not thinking properly. I am exhausted. I am discouraged because of an event that happened and not let us make a decision in that state of mind because it'll probably be the wrong decision. That's reacting from the pain from the moment. We need to be clear-headed, and it's wonderful if you have a friend who can ask you and help you to take a breath, sleep on it overnight, When God encountered Elijah, he listened to Elijah's reasons for his actions. He didn't rebuke him again. God just said to him, get back to work. Get busy. God said that. He, often the solution to depression is time, but not time moping around in the dark, eating half gallons of ice cream at a time. That gives you more to be depressed about. Often, that solution is to get up, to get back into your schedule. And that's where a good church family can help. As you worship with one another, you start learning each other. You develop a love for each other. And you can undergird each other. We undergird each other with prayer. We undergird each other with an arm around the shoulder. Or if it's appropriate, a hug. A hug can help so much. And, and that's where a good church family can help. They can know of your situation. Hopefully, you'll feel safe with someone to where you can share in depth what's going on. They can give you a place of fellowship and a place where you can help others. You see, often the way out is helping others. God reminded Elijah that regardless of how he felt, he wasn't alone. That's right. 
That's one of the big lies that we accept that I'm alone and no one's going through what I'm going through. But the reality is as humans, we tend to face the same situations. Someone's going through what we've been through. We watched that video last week, Drenched, where the man shared that at one time, he was not treating his wife right. He was not doing his work. He was lying, but he had discovered grace and forgiveness. Your situation is a mountain in your eyes that no one is climbing, but that is a misperception. Every one of us at one time or another is facing huge challenges. And so we need by faith to just know we are not alone. And we need again to accept each other that when, when one is down, we're not critical or judgmental, we're supportive. And maybe next week, a month, a year, we're the ones down with the tragedy and they're through theirs and we can minister to each other in these times. And we can do it with a common foundation of faith in Jesus Christ, with a common person within us, with a common power that we can share with each other and we can relate scripture to each other, that God is real and he knows and he cares. One of the ways to defeat depression and loneliness is to read God's word. I'm constantly amazed as I take time to read God's word, how I come away reinvigorated, recharged, re-energized. My hope is renewed because I have spent time with a God who sees all, knows all, loves all, and he loves me and he can show me the way if I will listen and seek his path. So reading God's word is a great way to overcome temptation and struggles. And in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, Paul wrote, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. We've all been where you are. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can bear and walk again. There's a song went around. I don't really like the song. It's when God closes a door, look for a window. And it's a nice idea to not give up, to look. But I really think what's more true is when God closes a door, there's a reason for that. Listen and pray until he opens the door he wants you to go through. Don't find an escape through a window of your own choosing. Wait before the Lord. Listen to him. Let him show you the way you should go. We want everything now. We want to hear it now. But there's benefit to waiting on the Lord. Read his word. Let him speak to you through his word and his Holy Spirit. Get rested. We need rest. Take a long bath, a long shower. Let it wash away the tension, the, the turmoil, the burden. Watch an uplifting movie. Take a walk. Put her in the garden. And while there are times when professional help is needed, there are more times we just need to get up, clean up, and get back into life, trusting not on our own strength, but trusting and knowing there's a God who's advocating for us. There's a God working on our behalf. There's a God who wants an abundant life for us. And so we can continue on our schedule, trusting him to resolve that which is bothering us. God had work to Isaiah Elijah to do. But he didn't rant to him about how pitiful and lazy he was. He patiently showed Elijah he was, that he was present and that he knew what Elijah had gone through. He knew what Elijah was going through. But two, God did not allow Elijah to stay in that cave, pining away, 
thinking he was alone. God needed Elijah to pass his mantle on to the next prophet. You see, Elijah didn't know. But that struggle, that battle with the prophets of Baal was his last big event. Another prophet was coming on the scene. God was going to bring Elijah home. And Elijah was ready to take over. And God needed him to pass that on. You can be assured the almighty, omniscient, all-powerful God knows where you are today. He knows where you've been. He knows what you've been through. He knows what tomorrow holds. He's already there. God is ready to embrace you. He's ready to soothe your soul. One of the descriptions of God is that he is a balm of Gilead. A balm, of course, being a soothing ointment that's often put on wounds. There's a great hymn, There is a Balm of Gilead. I want to read those words to you. It says, There is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. Sometimes I feel discouraged and I think my work's in vain, but then the Holy Spirit revives my soul again. There is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. If you cannot sing like angels, if you can't preach like Paul, you can tell the love of Jesus and say he died for all. Our community is needing us who have God to share with them there is a balm in Gilead. And they need us to be transparent, to say, I struggled with that. Whether it's alcoholism, addiction of any kind, uh, whatever it is, lying to cover yourself, uh, cheating. But God saved you from that. They need to hear, I was like you, but Jesus saved my soul. And now I live for him, and you can too. God will do all this in his time as you trust him. He knows how long you need to heal. He knows how long you need to mend. And something I want you to think of is sometimes when God withholds an answer, it's because he's preparing someone else to intercede on your behalf or to help you. He needs them to listen to him, to step up and do what he's saying. So sometimes the waiting, and if you study God's word, you'll find most of the time he works through his people. He occasionally intercedes from heaven and does a great work, but typically he works through his people. And so sometimes a delay is God getting someone ready to minister to you personally. But in his time, he'll make everything beautiful. Mm -hmm.